Hi, my name is Casey Legler. I am a former Olympian, 1996. I was a sprinter, uh, also an NC2A All-American and University of Arizona Hall of Famer. Super stoked to be here in conversation with Hudson Taylor, who you guys have already met, founder and executive director of Athlete Ally. And a lot of you are joining us from the huddle you're probably super fired up. You've heard a lot of things from a lot of phenomenal athletes and executives from the Golden State Warriors to uh, you know, Paralympian basketball, uh, Abby Duncan. You've heard from Jason Collins. These people are at the kind of like forefront of what it means to um, support and encourage and welcome LGBTQI athletes within their organizations. And it always feels like such a privilege uh, when, um, when I get asked to talk about this uh, because it's so important to me. So, oh, I'm very, very queer. By the way, if anyone who's watching this doesn't know, came out as trans many years ago, swam my last year as a gay human, and it was, you know, non-gender conforming. And, um, you know, so I'll just kind of put that in there in case there was anyone who was wondering. But uh, <laughs> I'm just really excited, Hudson, about jumping in to this post-huddle conversation. So I want to hear from you, Hudson, kind of by way of introduction to the work of Athlete Ally on why the mission of LGBTQI inclusion and protection in sports is so important. I mean, I know why I care, but I would love to hear from you why it's something that we all need to be caring about. That's a great question, Casey. So for me, I think there's three main reasons why uh, LGBTQ inclusion in sport is so important and why everybody should care about it. So first, I think that participation in sport is a human right that should be extended to everyone, regardless of your sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. The second reason why it's so important is that I think participation in sport offers so many wonderful things, physical, social, and emotional growth. It builds confidence, it creates community, and sets people up for success uh, later in life. And then the third thing that I would say is that, unfortunately, sport is, is still a space which oftentimes isolates, excludes, and at times endangers LGBTQ individuals. There are three pillars by which you do all of this work. Education, policy, and then athlete activism. I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit more about that. <laughs> athlete Ally does a lot of work around education. You know, one of my favorite athletes, I'm a massive fan of her, but one of the things that she said was so brilliant is Abby Duncan. She's a gold medalist. And one of the things that she talked about was the importance of her coach in helping her be all of who she was. And in turn, that helped her show up completely as like the most phenomenal athlete that she could be. I think one of the things that we've seen from the last nine years of doing this work is that unfortunately, the people with the most power are oftentimes the least educated on LGBTQ issues. And that especially starts with our coaches. My coaches were always like father figures to me. They're the kind of the most important people in my lives. They are the the mentors and stewards and the, the people who helped me learn what it meant to be a, a man, what it meant to um, be a be an athlete, be a leader. Um, and, and I I love my coaches, but they also were ill equipped to create a welcoming environment on LGBTQ issues. Um, unfortunately, the prerequisite for someone to become a coach in this country and around the world is, you know, here's a whistle, a clipboard, and a desire to coach, and now we're going to put you into the role of having one of the most important positions in a young person's life. And they are not yet equipped to make that environment as welcoming as it needs to be for the full diversity of their constituents. If we can create a standard for education for every coach in the country, that they are educated on LGBTQ respect and inclusion, then I think some of the, the reasons why we have less LGBTQ youth participating in sport, why the dropout rates are what they are, those things will start to change if the people in positions of power are more knowledgeable about what they should be saying and doing differently. Just a statistic for you, 80% of LGBTQ athletes are not out to their coaches, right? 
So if you are in an environment in which you have you feel as though you need to hide or conceal who you are, chances are you're not gonna wanna keep coming back. You know, my last year of swimming, I came out, I was non-gender conforming, only wore men's clothes, shaved my head, and was the top seed for the 50 meter freestyle at nationals that year. And I remember an official came into the locker room, took me out of the locker room and asked me, directed me to an individual bathroom stall outside um, where I was indicated, you know, I was told to change. And I'd like to think that that doesn't happen anymore. Unfortunately, your experience that you had um, is is still occurring, right? It, it, it's still the experiences of athletes today. Um, but the good news is that when coaches know better, they do better. And that at Athlete Ally, we are helping to provide that education so that really we can reconcile the disconnect between intent of words and actions and impact of words and actions. And I know that Athlete Ally does a lot of work around educating coaches. And you also have an online asset that is free and available. I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit more about that. So we built something called Champions of Inclusion. It is a free comprehensive curriculum for every coach in the country who wants to get educated on LGBTQ respect and inclusion. It's a total of 16 modules. Each module is about five to 10 minutes, pretty much on everything we would ever want a coach to know about how they create that more welcoming environment. And one of the things that you did was a coaches summit. During the Coaches Summit, is this uh, framework that you used similarly? And were they college level coaches, professional level coaches, or amateur level coaches? Unfortunately, we're still in an environment in which getting educated on LGBTQ issues is a choice. So what ends up happening is the people who do take the curriculum are already pretty educated. They may identify as allies themselves they're probably not the ones who are most perpetuating anti-LGBTQ bias. We're still missing those, those coaches who need to be receiving this information the most. And so one of the other ways in which we've been trying to go about solving that problem is through regional convenings. If we can partner with a coaches association or uh, a school district and say, hey, we're gonna come in, we're gonna provide this education in person at no cost, please join us. Uh, and we can get the people in positions of power to mandate that their coaches actually attend. The Pacific Northwest Coaches Summit was one of those things. So it was an opportunity for coaches to come to a, a full day summit that heard from experts in the field talking about what they can be doing to make their team a more welcoming environment. I think building that community, building that trust was so important and um, something we were really proud to be a part of and put together just so worth it. Like I said, I, not only that, but I wish it was longer. I wish it was more than one day. There needs to be way more um, establishments that take responsibility on speaking on social justice issues and politics. Um, my existence is political. And so, you know, as a queer Latina coming into a powerlifting space that all, they, all it is is, you know, growing on the feet of white supremacy. That, for me, that's a resistance and that is something that I need to be supported in. Rick Wells is the president and COO of the Golden State Warriors. I'm a massive fan of his work, massive fan of the team. He retells this story of what it was like when he came out. And these two things happened within the same week. He came out, which is massive. He was the first executive at that level to come out as gay in the NBA. And that same week, a player used a gay slur, you know, very famous player used a gay slur on the court. And so, you know, you guys have done work with the NBA. Is that because it's now inserted into the policy of the organization itself as mandatory training? I'm proud to say that the, the NBA as a league has been one of our longest, deepest partnerships that we've had. The work that we do in, in training their players through the rookie transition program is mandatory, right? You have 65 to 85 draft picks who are the future and, you know, the current and future icons of sport, they are required to go through four days of training, of which LGBTQ education is a part. 
So it's not just that. It's there's a whole host of different things that the players go through to get, you know, really as equipped as possible to be leaders, to be champions on and off the court. Um, but that is it, it is required, right? And that and that is a policy that is a, a mandate that comes from people in positions of power. And so that's why one of the other things that Afi Ally works so hard to do is try to create policy uniformity in the same way that you know some coaches are educated, some are not. When we look at the policies that govern sport, there is a patchwork of protections. So if you're an LGBTQ athlete at school A and you transfer to school B, it may not be the case that um, the, that you are equally protected or supported because of the policies of that institution. The experience of an athlete should be no different, regardless of what team they're on, what locker room they're sitting in, um, anywhere in the world. And that is a goal that we are very far away from reaching. But in order to reach it, we have to address the policies of sport. You know, Hudson, when we talk about this, I think about how my athletic career as a college athlete, student athlete, would have been different. I transferred away from U of A to another college on the East Coast if I had had the resources that would have helped me make better choices. Because the truth is, is that the team that I ended up on, after I came out, I came to you know cafeteria, sat down with everybody to eat, and the entire team got up and left. So I was alone as this non-gender conforming kid in the cafeteria with my whole team who I'd trained with, you know, four, five, six hours a day had just picked up and left. Now I hope that no other student athlete has to go through that, but I know that that's not true, that that is still happening. I'd say one of our probably um, strongest tools that I'm most excited about is something that we launched in 2017 called the Athletic Equality Index, where we really rank college athletic departments on their LGBTQ policies. It is our belief that with transparency comes accountability. So by creating the AEI, we've been able to rank and report on the policies of NCAA athletic departments. Many institutions have made significant changes to their scores. I can tell you when we first did the AEI, there was about uh, the number of schools who, who adopted the NCAA's trans-inclusive guidelines quadrupled from when we first uh, did the report to the second iteration of it. The Athletic Equality Index uh, would enable you to look at the specific policies of every Division I institution in the country. And what you'd be able to look at, you'd get a score of any institution, and that score would be based upon what policies they do or do not have in place that would support you as an LGBTQ individual. Things like uh, a fan code of conduct, does it explicitly prohibit uh, homophobic behavior? Is there a non-discrimination policy that supports on the basis of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity and gender expression? Are there trans-inclusive guidelines? Is your institution partnering with the LGBT Center on that campus for any programs? Um, has that institution invested in annual trainings to, for their athletes and for their coaches? Uh, what is their sexual harassment policy? Does it actually explicitly protect the LGBTQ community in that work? And I said this before, when people know better, they do better. I can imagine that having the Athlete Equality Index and understanding if this was a place where I was gonna be welcome in all of my diversity, I probably would have gone to that school over another. I like the idea of all of these queer LGBTQI athletes knowing where they're gonna be able to go so that who they are is, not, is a non-issue and they can get on with the business of being phenomenal athletes. You know, this makes me think of the competitiveness. It's like, it's just good business. Also, as an athlete, I'm pretty competitive. I think I think a lot of people <laughs> in athletic departments are pretty competitive. So and they're they, like, I'm gonna nail this. I'm gonna be yeah. the best. This is an Athlete Allies Student uh, Athlete um, Activism Summit. Uh, basically, giving us the tools and the power to connect to one another to um, activate change on our local campuses and beyond. Now all of you are a part of this wheel for me, right? You are a part of my network now. You are a part of my community of supporters and allies, just as I am yours. There's a deep history of 
athlete activism, you know? I was thinking about the images that I grew up with, you know, of Tommy Smith and John Carlos raising their fists in solidarity. And also Peter Norman, the silver medalist of that 200 meter uh, race as an ally wearing the OPHR badge. And the OPHR was a project that they'd come up with that was the Olympic Project for Human Rights. So it was like that whole podium was an announcement that rejected systemic racism at the you know, IOC level, but then all the way down to what was happening here in the United States. Fast forward, here we are in 2020, where, you know, Kaepernick is the inheritor of this. We have the WNBA who is, you know, wearing Breonna Taylor shirts, has now pivoted and activated voters in Georgia to vote for Warnock. This is happening. We want to live in a world in which athlete activism is both accepted and at times expected. There's this culture that still says, stick to sports, shut up and dribble. I was told by, this by my father. He was like, the, you know, I shaved my head because I could not stand how they were treating women athletes. Yep. Shaved it because all the guys got to shave it. I was like, there is a difference with how they are treating me and how they are treating them, and I cannot stand it anymore. Yeah. And when I came home, my dad was like, that's not, that's not the place to do that. You should have just swum. You should have just, you know. Yeah. And I was like, where, if not there, where else? Yeah. In my backyard? Like, this is a problem. It's a systemic problem. And I was crazy enough at the time to try and do something about yeah. it. Our Athlete Activism Summit was one of the pieces of programming which I'm really proud about. We brought together athletes from across the country. Mainly these were student athletes who had already started Athlete Ally chapters at their school and were really trying to figure out how do I continue this work in a strategic way? And how do I build community with the other athletes across, this, across the country who are also engaging in that work? So over the course of an entire day, uh, we worked with these athletes to do um, things like power mapping at their institution, understanding where their allies and their obstacles were at their institution, who they could rely upon to help them get a pride night started or help get a policy changed. And then we also gave, um, gave every participant sort of a guidebook that they could take back to their chapter for facilitated conversations going forward so that when they do convene their teammates or the people who are involved with the chapter, they knew what type of topics they could bring up and have a facilitated dialogue that would be most beneficial to improving the culture and the climate of their institution. There is an audience there that is making, um, that is available to be educated is open to it, and then suddenly there's familiarity with what it means to have excellence in a woman, in a queer woman, in someone who is standing up for justice, understands the intersections of this within the communities that they live in. And I guess my question to you is the issue can sometimes be as an LGBTQ athlete, simply coming out is a point of activism. Only when athletes are divided can forms of, of silencing or forms of oppression maintain, which is why at Athlete Ally, we've worked for the past nine years to try to educate and activate athletes to use their cultural capital, to use their platform intentionally and strategically. What can we do to, you know, of course, support you and Athlete Allies' work. And what can we do for those of us who are retired, have moved into different industries, to help the younger athletes who are coming up feel like we are here to support them? I would say I think everybody has time, treasure, or talent that they can give to help us end homophobia and transphobia in sport. If it's time that you can give, that's time that we would love for you to take out of your day to open up an email and write to your alma mater. Ask them what they're doing about LGBTQ issues in sports. Um, if you're a parent, write an email to the athletic director at your, at your kid's school. Say, hey, this is an issue, right? Um, how are you combating this? How are you addressing this? Taking that time to ask those questions of people in positions of power 
are oftentimes the only thing that stands in the way of good work getting done. Take the time to talk to people in your life about it. Even just having a dialogue about, hey, have you ever thought about why this is an issue? What do you think can be done about it? Um, that's still meaningful. You know, I, I think everybody has, has impact in, in their own little universe, in their own community and um, progress moves at the speed of trust and you can only really begin to build that trust through intentional dialogue. Treasure, uh, you know, Athlete Ally is a nonprofit. Um, while we are the leader doing LGBTQ inclusive work, we need your investment and your support to make that work possible. And then the third thing I would just say is talent. If you have talent in, um, I don't know, there's like a million ways in which we could use everyone's talent. Um, as a small staff, you know, we are continuing to try to update uh, our education work. So if you have that kind of ped pedagogical expertise, it can really help us make our education as um, data-driven as possible. On our fundraising, we definitely need help. We need that talent of helping us ask and solicit and store the people who could be helping drive our mission further and farther than it's currently going. I think everybody has time, treasure, or talent to give, and we need all three in great abundance. So if you're watching this and you are interested, I hope that you'll take us up on any of those three opportunities. You know, I read something in the newspaper a couple of weeks ago that two of the Supreme Court justices in the United States suggested that you know, a new case against gay marriage should be brought before them and rescind the 2015 ruling around the Equal Marriage Act. And, you know, that that law allowed for me and my wife to get married, who's Australian. That allowed for us to come to the United States together. That allows for me to go into the hospital with her. We have so far to go. And it is alarming, especially here in the United States, when we start hearing at the highest level, folks beginning to talk about taking away the rights of LGBTQ. And so it makes me nervous about this even smaller population that are our young athletes who just want to play a sport. They just want to benefit from all of the things that you've said. And the idea that we would exclude these young kids from the possibility of playing a sport at the amateur level, at the collegiate level, makes no sense. And I like so much that you've broken out the things that I can still do personally, because the truth is, is it can be discouraging, but you distilled it in that perfect kind of athletic coach way that I, of course, respond to, right? Which is, if you've got time, give it. If you've got cash, give it. And if you've got talent, give it. Because the truth is, is that while we have come a long way, you are a small organization that is admirably punching way above its weight at the international highest levels of sport, simply saying everybody deserves to play with dignity. So I feel pumped. When I first started Athlete Ally, I asked a, an activist, you know, what does it mean to fight for social change? What does it mean to be an ally and an activist? And he said, um, Hudson, I want you to imagine yourself standing at the edge of a cliff. At the bottom of that cliff is the ocean, and beyond that is the sunrise. Now, when you stand up and speak out for the things you believe in, and you fight to make the world a better place for the people in it, you take one step closer towards that edge. You know, you feel a little bit scared, a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit unsure as to what people might say, what they might do. But the truth is, is that when you choose to go towards the fear and stand on that edge, that's the role of an ally, that's the role of an activist, somebody who's trying to ch shape the world for the better. And when you are in this place, I can promise you two things. The first is that from this place, there can be nobody who stands in front of you. And the second is that it then becomes your responsibility to describe that sunrise to everybody who stands behind you. And that sunrise is the possible, it's the future, it's whatever we want sport to look like. So if we choose to use whatever time, treasure, or talent we have, 
in whatever way we feel comfortable, um, we're gonna make that sunrise a reality. Hudson, thanks so much for your time. I'm so grateful to you and the work that you guys do at Athlete Ally. And I'm so uh, thankful for including me in being a part of this conversation. Thank you. At Athlete Ally, we believe in the power of sport to inspire us and to bring us together across divides. Joining together with student athletes, professional athletes, and beyond, we work to build spaces where every athlete is safe, welcomed, and included. When we all stand for equality, we can create a world where all LGBTQ athletes can thrive. Donate today.